refresh us by your spirit in the name of Jesus. Father, as we lift up our hearts, as we lift up our hands, I pray that the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow like the day of Pentecost to refresh us, to revive us, to re-energize us today. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Pastor Jeff and Sarah, would you come up in, in, would you stand in for Mel and Cherry Joe? We're going to pray over you today. And I want Pastor Eric and Sylvia to come and pray. We're going to pray over them today. You see, um, Eric has been um, called back to duty on Sundays. And so we're going to pray that, um, that God will change that. How many of you would agree with me on that? So I want some men to come and gather around uh, Pastor Eric and some ladies to gather around uh, Sylvia and Pastor Jeff and Saren. And we're gonna, they're going to stand in for Mel and Cherry Joe. Uh, Cherry Joe had a procedure this week. She couldn't even walk this morning. And she's at ER. Uh, they took her to the emergency room this afternoon. And we're going to pray uh, for complete healing. So let's pray for them right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for Mel and Cherry Joe, God. Lord, I pray that uh, you would touch them, Lord. I pray, Father, that what Satan has meant for harm, you would turn it around for the good, for the saving of many lives, in Jesus' name. I pray, Father, that you would be with them. God, I don't know if they're still at the hospital or at home, but Father, touch them. Let them feel your presence right now. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for Pastor Eric and Sylvia, Lord. And God, we need them here on Sundays. We need Pastor Eric on Sundays. And Father, I just pray that you would turn this situation around, God. That, Father, it'll be a short season, Lord. God, you've done it before, and I pray that you do it again, Lord. Turn it around. Turn it around. Turn it around. Turn it around, Lord, in Jesus' name. I thank you. Is there any Okay. Father, we worship you. Come on, let's just lift up our hands now, and let's just thank God. Come on, let's sing, Lord, I'm amazed by you. And let's just see in our mind's eye today. Uh, uh, Cherry Joe being risen up. Let's see in our mind's eye today. Pastor Eric worshiping with us on Sundays. Father, we thank you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed. As he has loved us, now let us love one another. Would you turn around, shake hands, greet each other, give each other a high five or a hug? Come on, we came from uh, three different campuses, four different services today. Now let's minister to each other. Come up, can you come up at the end or do you need to go? Can you come up at the end? Oh, okay, just want to make sure. Can you come help me, please? Can you pass those out for me, please? Thank you, sir. (laughs) 
You know, I love um, all the worship leaders we have. You know, I, I go over to the North Campus on Tuesdays and on Sundays and I hear Jessa lead worship and I'm just, oh, that was the best. And then I come over here and I hear Mariah sing and I think, oh, that was the best. And then I hear Kevin lead worship. And I go, oh, that, that was really good. And you know, each of them have their own special touch. Isn't that great? And, and Pastor David, I don't know who the gentleman you had lead worship in the Spanish service at noon, but that was incredible worship. I mean, I, I, I watched the Spanish service today, didn't understand a thing that was going on, but I could feel the presence of God, and it was so wonderful. Is, is he part of our fellowship, or did he come? Oh, he's, he's part of the Spanish church. All right, wow, so we got another great worship leader. That is wonderful. So glad to, to hear that. You have an out... I, <laughs> Let me start over. You have an outline yes. called the five leadership roles in the church. And we're going to talk about that tonight. And um, today was a three-day weekend for many people. And I understand next weekend is a three-day weekend for many people. And, you know, when we put these meetings together, I think, oh, we can't do this because of that. Or, oh, we should move this to here. You know what? I'm going to stay on plan and minister to you if you're here. And if you're not, that's okay. But we're going to stay on plan this year, okay? And these meetings are important. We're on Facebook. As I mentioned uh, today in our service, we, we will have 100 people watch our first service. Uh, I don't think we have 100 people in the first service, but we've got more people watching us than are here. Uh, we'll have, uh, we, one week we had nearly 300 watch on Facebook the second service. That's okay because we're reaching people, amen? And so tonight people are probably watching and tuning in, and if you are, hit the like button. Today I want you to turn, if you would, to Ephesians. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4. Four, and we're going to talk about the five leadership roles in the church. And um, I want you to mark this in your Bible if it's not already, because Romans talks about the leadership gifts, Ephesians talks about the leadership gifts, and all of you that are leaders. You walk in the leadership gifts, maybe one, maybe two, maybe them all. I believe as a pastor, uh, I, I see myself in all of these gifts. Uh, I see Pastor Jeff in all of these gifts. Uh, and, and when I look at some of you, I say, ah, oh, that's Russell. I, I look and I say, oh, that's Roy, you know, and, and I hope tonight that as we go over these gifts that it will help you to determine where you are and so that you can use your gift. And what we want to do is we want to teach you and train you to use your gift and to use it more effectively. Does that, does that, is, is that a good plan? Because let me tell you something. God is not into addition. He's into multiplication. One and one is two, two plus two is four, and that's good, and we do add, the Bible says the adds to the church, but as leadership, we are not to be in the addition game, but the multiplication game, okay? When I came here 20 years ago, we had one campus, one service, and now we have multiple campuses and multiple services. Why? Because my job is not to reach the world, but to teach people to reach the world. And in your particular ministry, you are to do the same. Your ministry that you are over is your church. Those are the people that you pastor. When Eddie Gonzalez comes in here on Saturday morning and he does a men's breakfast, he is pastoring and leading those men in that role at that time. Does that take away from me? Not at all. I'm glad that Pastor Eddie Gonzalez will reach people that Pastor Eddie Summers can't reach. Multiplication. 
I go over to the North Campus where Jeff and Saren are, and they're doing a great job as campus pastors, and I see them operating in their gifts of pastoring, their, uh, their apostolic anointing. I see new families being added to the church. I see us uh, not just uh, adding, but multiplying, and I say, yay God, because I don't have to teach every Bible study. I don't have to teach every service because he has appointed in the church pastors right so it's not taking away from me it's not about me it's about the role it's about the ministry of Jesus Christ and the role each of us play I like what John Maxwell in his leadership Bible he talks about these and in Ephesians 4 12 through 16 it says God gave at least, uh, Maxwell talks about here, he says that God gave at least five types of leaders in the church. And what are they? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And they exist, it's there on the top of your outline, to complete the members' growth and equip them to serve now not all of us are pastors and apostles and and prophets and evangelists some of us are a ministry of helps but whatever it is that God has called you to do whatever ministry he has you doing in the church that is your group that you are responsible for to mature and to get people excited so that you can multiply and not divide that's very important. That's why we talk about multi-campus. Because when we get to talk about, well, the North Church and the South Church, what does that do? That divides and it causes division and then there becomes a rivalry between the North and the South. Then we talk about the East and, and developing the East and developing the West campuses. And if we don't have the mindset that we are all one church in multiple locations, then we become divided and God doesn't want us divided. Just like, you know, we, we had to break that real early. You know, uh, North Campus needed a communion table one time. And I, and I, you know, we had two here, so I just moved one over to the North Campus. And the rumor was they stole the communion table. <laughs> now, that was many years ago. But see, that told me as a leader that I needed to do a better job explaining that we were one church at multiple lo locations. Does that make sense? So let's talk about the five leadership roles. This is a good way to remember the five-fold ministry gifts. Take your hand like this. I've done this before, and this is very important. Your thumb represents the apostle. Why? Because he touches all the other gifts. The prophet is the pointer finger because he points the way to the truths of God. Middle finger represents evangelist. Why? Evangelist win souls that's why they're above all the other gifts the ring finger is the pastor because he's married to the church and the teacher is the pinky because he brings as the pinky brings balance to the hand so the teacher brings a balance to the church so we have apostle prophet evangelist pastor and teacher where do you fall in that that's what we're going to talk about tonight number one it talks about the apostle on your outline. What is an apostle? An apostle is one sent forth to pioneer and establish new works and new leaders. That's what Jessa and uh, Russell are doing right now. They're establishing right now a Bible study east side because they're pioneering and establishing a new campus. That's what we need in the church. We need the apostles to be able to go out and do that so we can come together. An apostle can pastor, but his primary function is to go out. His, uh, his primary function is to establish new works and new leaders. Next month, March 11th, a month from today, Apostle Bob Cathers is going to be with us from Simi Valley. 
He is over several churches. He's an apostle. You know what he does? His, his style's a little bit different than I do. But, 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 the, 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 but the, what am I trying to say? Uh, the results are the same. What he does is he'll go to a campus and he'll build it up and then he'll bring in a pastor and he'll go down the street or the next city or whatever. And, and his, his uh, philosophy is he's just building these churches and bringing them up. And I want him to come. He's going to come and he's going to speak at both campuses next week. And then he's going to do our leadership meeting next Sunday night. And please, I'm telling you a month, uh, a month ahead of time because you need to be here. And, and not just watch it online. Because you need to be exposed to a true apostolic anointing. And when you are exposed to a true apostolic anointing in person, and that apostolic anointing prays for you, it's going to rock your world, right, uh, Eric? Because <laughs> Eric and the guys met him at the, the men's uh, advance, and, and he rocked our world. Why? Because that's what an apostle does. He establishes, he releases new leaders, and, and you can be around an apostle, and, and you just know it. You just feel, it just feels different. The apostle that, that, that I consider my apostle, pastor and apostle, uh, you know, in Las Vegas, uh, Paul and Denise Goulet, uh, you know, you just, you just feel different when you're around the guy. Why? Because he sees, he sees the world different than everybody else. He sees the church different from everybody else. Why? Because he sees leaders. He, he sees new things happening. And, and he's never satisfied with the old. He, uh, he has to be focused towards the new. And, and when I started meeting with him and he laid his hands on me and, and I received an apostolic anointing, it's like I get bored real easy. Okay, this is established. Okay, fine. Now let's go and let's, go for, let's march forward to do something new. Does that make sense? And so, you know, I was telling Eleanor and, and Shirley before the service, you know, I'm a recovering, uh, I'm a recovering um, a perfectionist, right? And, and, and I, you know, I would see things and it just drive me nuts. Pastor Jeff, when, you know, he used to clean the church, you know, he knew, and Eddie Gonzalez used to clean the church. They knew, they knew, man, Saturday night, early Sunday morning, there was going to be a chair inspection, you know, because we tear the place down and set it up every week. And I'm not kidding. I would get up to preach. And, and if that second row was two inches this way, it would rock my world. And we'd have a meeting about it, wouldn't we, gentlemen? And the Lord began to speak to me. And he said, that's a distraction. Yes, you want things nice. Yes, you want things in order. But I was so focused on the ascetics, I was missing the big picture of multiplication. Now, here's the balance. You don't, you, you don't do away and say, oh, well, it just doesn't matter how things look. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's saying there's a balance. I like the things to look good but I don't allow a chair being gone or a light being out. Oh, that used to just drive me nuts. I would come in and, and, and the devil would make sure every week the light right above me was off. Or it was, or it was burnt out, and it would distract me so much that I could hardly g move into my gift. Was there some good things about it? Yeah, there probably was, but there was more negative. So you know what? Now, if a light's out, I go, "Oh, look, a light's out." Well, we're just trying to show you that we're not perfect around here, and just go with the flow. Because if you don't go with the flow, the enemy will distract you. Now, now, just don't throw up your hands and say, well, it doesn't matter if the church is a mess on Sunday. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about have a balance. Have it nice. Have your ministry. I think Pastor Eric and Sylvia, they do that so wonderful. You know, they've set up this great room. I, this is one of my favorite rooms. You know, because it just has that intimate feel. You know, because uh, Sylvia, she's a decorator. She, she went out. She didn't have much a, of a budget. And she got furniture. And she set up the corners and the different things. And I love that. That's part of her gifting. And, and, and so as we move in our giftedness, and, and she does that, and I do my part, and, and you do your part, then we can begin to truly multiply. Amen? And then there's the prophet. 
the one who speaks forth God's word to inspire, correct, and motivate. I think one of the truest prophetic gifts that we have in our church at Grace Assembly is Debbie Aaron. Would you agree with that? I mean, Debbie can spank you spiritually and do it in such a way that you feel so good, you say, may I have another? You know, that's just Mama Debbie. You know, she's very prophetic. Saren is very prophetic. Saren is so prophetic that she scares people sometimes. She was preaching at the South, uh, the North Campus a couple weeks ago. And she was talking about, was it last week? Yeah, last week. And she was talking about her stare. You know, Saren will have that stare. You know, and stuff. And I've heard people, and I was so glad that she talked about it because I've heard people say, that girl scares me. And I say, oh, don't let, it, don't let it stare you. She's just seeing things in the spirit. Good things. They're good things. Right, Saren? And that's just the way she operates. But when I heard Saren kind of tease herself about it, I could just feel everybody in the room go, oh, yeah, that's what it is. You see, because some things that are perceived as weakness to others, when we can laugh at it ourselves, we make them feel comfortable. We feel comfortable. Because Saren has never wanted to scare anybody that I know, except Jeff. But, but I mean, other than that, you know, but, but she's very prophetic. She sees things. I love the prophetic in her, the prophetic anointing. I would even go as far as to say the prophet anointing that is in her. Okay, so what do we do? We celebrate our gifts. And now, now, and I've said this, you know, jokingly a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to say it again. When Pastor Apostle Bob Cathers comes in, be, be prepared because he's not nice like me. Now, now, he's not mean, but he's very focused. And some people perceive that as mean. But it's not. He's one of the most loving guys. Man, a guy that prays eight hours a day, come on. You got to have some love in there, right? That just amazes me when he talks about praying eight hours a day. Man, I can pray eight minutes and go, what am I having for breakfast? You know, you know what I'm saying? But that's his gift to the body of Christ. An apostle has to be in prayer. I've had to discipline myself in prayer because that's where things are birthed. Amen. So, so we need that. We need that apostle. We need that prophet. The, uh, number three, the evangelist. On your outline, one who shares Christ with outsiders and trains others to do so. Charlie Bauer is an evangelist. I love when he and Rose and the team, I think Marty's been helping some of the prayer teams, they go out. And Charlie, Charlie is so classic because when you feel something burning in you and other people, it doesn't burn in them, it just ticks you off, you know? And he came to me not long ago, he goes, I just don't understand why people aren't signing up and helping me. I said, it's all right, Charlie. People are, God's going to bring the right people not everybody is excited about evangelism my wife Janae used to bug me for years I would say come on we're gonna pass out well honey I need to go I've got you know oh we're gonna have this this outreach and it's gonna be outside and there's gonna be a thousand people and she'll say you know it's gonna be 110 Saturday do you really want to do that and I used to get so angry at her I would think what's wrong with you and finally she said honey I love seeing people get saved but I'm a prophetic psalmist not an evangelist and I went oh yeah but because I am, I wanted her to be. That's like Dan, uh, Dan Nature, our children's pastor. He does not understand why everybody's not in children's ministry. He gets mad when I say, you got to get out of children's ministry and come to church. Why? There's kids out there. And I love that enthusiasm. If you ask Dan Nature what Grace Assembly is about, he'll say, let me tell you about how God is reaching kids. Because his ministry is the most important ministry in the church. And yours should be as well. 
uh, they, they tore the gate down. The drunk driver ran into the gate last uh, week. And, and man, I was in a hurry to get it fixed because I need that fence around the, uh, the yard in the house. You know what I'm saying? And so this guy, Sal, uh, he was in the neighborhood doing some other work and he left a card on, uh, on my door. And so I called him and I said, hey, you, I got your, uh, your card on my door. Do you, do you do wrought iron? He goes, yeah, I'm unemployed right now. I'm really hungry. He came over and he gave me a present he was hungry because <laughs> he gave us a great price and so I said go, go for it and so he measured you know and he he came over one day and he did some of it I think on Friday and then he came back Saturday because he had to or excuse me he came back Sunday because he had to measure and he finished it Monday but anyway he came back and Charlie and the team they were out front in the tent and they saw him and so, you know what they did? I mean, they're, they're like saying sick them to a dog. I mean, these, these people, I mean, they see somebody and it's like, meat, meat that needs to be saved, you know? And so they go over to him, they go, hey, how you doing? Anyway, make a long story short, they led Sal to the Lord, along with about five other people. Yeah, come on and clap. And so he comes over Monday and he starts the fence and I go outside and I go, hey, Sal, how you doing? He said, good. He said, I, I'm going to start coming to church. And I said, well, good. He goes, yeah, my wife and I, we've been thinking about it. He said, he said my, my brother, he started going to church and, and he, it turned his life around. I need my life turned around too. And I said, that's wonderful. And, and, and I said, do you know Jesus? And he smiled. And I mean, he was beaming. He goes, oh, yeah, your guys got me yesterday. <laughs> and I said, was it Sikkim, Charlie? No, no, I didn't. I didn't say that. And he said, I gave my life to Jesus. He said, I gave my life to Jesus. And, and, and they prayed for me. And you know what he said to me? I love what he said to me. He looked at me and he said this to me and I quote, damn, I feel good. <laughs> he did. True story. True story. He looked me right in the eye because that was the only way, the only language that he knew to express himself. Damn, I feel good. <laughs> and I said, well, damn, I'm glad you do too. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I didn't really. And he said, Pastor, he came back, he finished the fence, and he came back Tuesday, and he goes, now, now I want to finish this one. And he gave us a prize to, to, to finish and put gates in so that the whole campus will be secured. And, 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 uh, and, and he gave us this great prize. And I said, well, now that you're a member, go sharpen your pencil. Uh, you know? And I didn't really. I'm just kidding. And, and, he's, and he wants to help. It's great. And he told me, he says, now, now, oh, and we prayed for his wife. He said, my wife doesn't see a need for church. And so I prayed with him on Monday. And when he came back on Tuesday, he said, my wife has had a change of heart. We're going to be in church together. And he said, now we're going out of town this weekend because we get our taxes done in Oxnard or somebody said, but the next week we're going to be there. Our kids are going to be there. See, what if we wouldn't have had that outside? Sal still might be lost or Sal may have found, may, maybe a Mormon found him. Or a Jehovah's Witness. Or somebody else like that. Because let me tell you, they're not afraid to go out. They're not afraid to knock on doors. Yeah, sir. Exactly. And you know what? That is such a great point because I thought that... Thank God for the drunk driver that went through that fence. Because I was panicked. Oh my, look at what Satan is doing. But look, God did something greater than that drunk driver. That is such a great point. And, and, and so... What am I saying? Evangelism. I'm excited about evangelism. Why? Because as a pastor, as my primary motivated, or my primary gift of pastoring, I love people being saved. I love building churches. It's part of the apostolic. You have a primary gift and you have a secondary gift. Now, I believe, as I study the scripture, that a pastor can function in all five. I believe that anybody that's called to the fivefold ministry gift can function in all five, but you have a primary. Find your primary and focus in it. And then, and that's why the fivefold ministry gift is so important to the church, because we are not, as a church, we are not going to reach this city until 
all five of those those gifts are in operation because we need the prophet and you know the prophecy has scared i mean as an assemblies of god pastor i mean you know you you talk about prophet and they go at meetings and they go whoo you know yeah i remember when god did that you know it's scary why because that gift got out of whack so instead of just getting it in order it was easier to throw it away but I'm glad that I'm part of an organization called the Assemblies of God that is now embracing it. We've always embraced evangelism. Apostle, I mean, if you call somebody an apostle in our group, I mean, you get the stares. But I love what our, our network supervisor, uh, our network overseer, Pastor Rich Guerra, he said, we are coming back as the Assemblies of God. I, I heard him say it, I was in a meeting in his office and he said, or at the district uh, council office, and he said, he said, we're coming back to our apostolic roots. Coming back to our apostolic roots. And I believe that. Number four is the pastor, one who shepherds, guides, and guards God's people to serve. And then teachers. What are teachers? One who trains God's people in the truth and teaches others to do so. I love Roy Nichols. He is a true teacher. And you know what? It is so funny because every Wednesday night, now that he is the main teacher for our men's group on Wednesday night, they, he works more overtime. I'm telling you, if you want overtime, commit to something, and the devil will make sure you get your overtime. And he came to me and he said, well, Pastor, maybe I need to resign. I can't always be here. I said, no, we're not going to let that distraction keep you. I'm there, Jim Hamilton's there, Phil's there, our elders are there, we can go by, but we are not going to allow that seat, but if I was still a perfectionist, I would have said, well, you know, Brother Roy, we need to be consistent, and we do need consistency, consistency is very important, but throwing away a gift to be consistent would be a sin in my opinion. Sometimes consistency and other things that are secondary have to be pushed aside so that the primary can come and be focused on. Does that make sense? Yes, Lisa. Teachers, uh, one who trains God's people in the truth and teaches others to do so. When the church fills these five offices, ordinary people are equipped for ministry. Ask yourselves the following questions. What eternally significant growth occurs in the lives of those I lead? Those of you that are department heads, you're not just a, a department head. You are pastoring the people that are in your department. You may not be a full-time pastor like me. You may not ever have a pulpit in the sanctuary, but you have a pulpit where you are. And you are to pour into the lives of the people you lead. And then we have the scripture, Ephesians 4.11. I'm not going to go into that. And then number two, do people understand that my role is to equip them to serve? Not only are you serving, not only am I serving, but we're equipping people to serve and so that they in turn can go and get more. Number four, do our people know that involvement in service is essential to growth? Ephesians 4.12 says that these gifts are to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And as we build people up, we grow. Church growth, we are not focused on. We are focused on church health. Because church health brings church growth. I know churches that have sprang up to be a thousand, two thousand in a year or two. And most of those churches don't survive. Why? Because they're babies. And a baby of a thousand has a hard time crawling. But a mature person, a mature church at a thousand doesn't skip a beat. God is giving us more when we do his word to equip people and we become mature. God, what if God would have blessed us with a thousand people when we had the mentality, North Campus stole our communion table. 
Satan couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't have destroyed us. We would have imploded from within. Satan cannot destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Only the church of Jesus Christ can destroy the church of Jesus Christ when we stay babies. It is time to grow up. We had a person leave the prayer team because they were going around praying one Sunday and they were passing the mic. And just before it got to this individual, uh, the leader said, now we're going to change the direction. Took that personally and left the church. Why? Baby. A baby shouldn't be praying over other people. Baby needs to be mature. So you know what? That individual just saved us some work. Because they weren't equipped to do that. Well, she got to lead worship three times last month, and I only got one. Baby, grow up. Well, he's preaching, and I, I want to preach. Baby, grow up. When you threw your little fit, you just proved why you weren't doing that. I'm not playing, folks. It's time to grow up. Because when we grow up into maturity, then we can reach our city, our community for Christ. Number five, do our people grow spiritually mature as a result of their ministry involvement? They need to be. Verse 13, Ephesians 4 says, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Do our people's lifestyle reflect Christ? God's character, verse 13, until we all reach the unity in the flesh of the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, write that down again, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Number seven, what percentage of our, of our people's faith and involvement is easily shaken? When, when we no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown away and they're, uh, uh, and they're by every uh, wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness and people in the deceitful scheming. Folks, uh, we had uh, some people not long ago that I thought were going to be major leaders. And, and I, you know, was grooming them. I was kind of behind them. And then they came to me and said, yeah, you know, we, we started listening to this teaching where, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are all cool and stuff, and you can speak in tongues, but, you know, that's, that's only for special purposes. I thought, what? What? Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and this teaching that we've been listening to, they were shaken, not by a false doctrine, but part of a doctrine, part of the truth. And I was really taken back because I thought they were further along than that. And God said, just release in love and let them experience where, what they need to experience. And if they're to be part of the ministry, they'll come back. But this will be a huge learning curve for them. Am I mad at them? No. Am I hurt? No. I'm mad at the devil. For getting some bad teaching. Folks, be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you listen to. Because oh, there's a lot of teaching out there that sounds really good. But it's really off. And I like what Suzanne Hinn, Benny Hinn's wife, said when she was in this church, in this building. She said, 99% of obedience is still rebellion. Because obedience is 100%. And there are teachers. And our, uh, our city is full of them. Why? Because we are a target of men and women pastoring, trying to apostle that have no idea what they're doing. They want the title and they're not in the function of it. And I don't say that in judgment. I'm saying, God, we've got to turn that around in prayer. I, I know teachers that are trying to pastor. They need to get with pastors and, and, and release their teaching gifts. I know apostles that are trying to be senior pastors and they need to do what Pastor Bob Cathers does, release it to a pastor once they've got it up and going. Because when we can learn to do this and do it in order, then we'll have blessing. Number eight, do our people build up one another? And that's what I want us to do. Now, on the back of that paper, I want you to write some things down. 
I talked about it this morning and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I went through those fast. That was a good review. But number one, three things that God wants us to do as a team this year. Number one, and I want you to write that down. Three things that God wants us to do this year as a church. Number one, think bigger. When God spoke to me that in my prayer time this week on my prayer patio, that I love my prayer patio. Thank you, gentlemen. You know who you are that paid for that and the guys that did it. But I love that prayer patio that I have. God spoke to me and he said, you're not dreaming big enough. And I said, well, God, you know, I'm, I want to reach more people. I, I want to, you know, I, I want to, I want to, I've been believing you all last year. God, fill up the two services. And he said, is that all you want? Oh, okay. He said, think bigger. Number two, this is what God wants for me and wants for you. This is what he said, dream bigger. And number three, Plan bigger. Plan bigger. So I began to look at the things that were in the back of my mind that I really hadn't put in the forefront because I'm thinking, well, we're not there yet. Well, that may be too much. Oh, people aren't going to be able to grasp it. Listen, I am to cast the vision and you may not get it right away, but I'm going to keep casting it until we do get it. Amen? Amen. And so when I see this campus, I see it full of kids. I see a school here. Are we able to start a school right now? Absolutely not. It would probably bankrupt us. But it's part of the vision. And so all the analyticals, all the analyticals, you know who you are. God bless you. I'm sure you have a purpose. I haven't found it yet. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I start dreaming about a school and I feel, well, did you know what it caught? Did you know? Well, I'm not talking about today. We'll get there. I'm not stupid. I know to count the cost before I do something. But it's not going to stop me from dreaming. So when you hear me say something, it may not be for today, this week, this month, this year, but just dream with me. Just think big with me. Let's start planning towards it. Amen. I see where that building used to be on this campus. I see a full-size basketball court with an awning, with all kinds of stuff, eventually a gymnasium around it. Do you know how much that costs? That would be impossible. Today it would, but let's think big. Let's, let's plan big, and let's believe God to bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. So don't give me these emails. Well, Pastor, do you know what that cost? Well, do you? Yeah. I do. And I have a board that keeps me very accountable. I see a prayer garden in this campus. I see a prayer garden in this campus. I see a beautiful, it's, it's, I can see it in my mind, it's kind of got this awning and it's got this, all this nature and it's got these waterfalls and these brick things and it's a place where people can just go in the summer and find a refreshing place. In the winter can find the warmth, the beauty of nature around it. I've had that, that thought for 19 years that I've been the pastor here and I've never said it because I thought, wow, people think I'm nuts. Well, I don't care anymore because you know after 19 years I am nuts. <laughs> that North Campus, man, I, I, I see it filled up three and four times. The, the East Side, yeah, I see that Bible study just bursting out into a, a thriving campus. Why? Because I'm not into addition. I'm into multiplication. And when I can train you through these meetings to get a hold of what God has called you to do and bless you and send you forth, then I win, you win, but most of all, the body of Christ and Jesus himself wins. I'm not threatened by anybody. I've asked God many times. You probably need to send somebody smarter, faster, and wiser than me. And when God sends them, I, I got the keys ready to hand it to them. I'm not here because I need a job. I'm here because God has called me to do it. And I said yes. I said yes to God, and I said yes to my wife when 
when 19 years ago when I told her what God had told me to do to come here and do what we're doing today she said you better be right because I'm not moving again so I don't I don't I don't fear God <laughs> but that woman motivates me love you honey 26 years God God bless you so what do I mean by think bigger Department heads, people in ministry, what is it that you want to see with, with, for your ministry? Think bigger. I, I, I love the North Campus. You know, it got to be too much when we started the two services here, you know, to share a lot of the team. So Pastor Jeff, he started thinking bigger. Jessa, uh, Russell, they started thinking bigger. They came to me and they said, and, and Lon, Lon was the, he, he goes, God's going to raise up. I, Pastor, love your vision. Thankful for the help, but God is going to raise up here what we need. And I thought, oh yeah, huh, God could do that. I was wearing people out. Because as a perfectionist, I wanted it to sound just like the North Campus to sound just like the South Campus. And guess what? It ain't never going to happen. Because North Campus is going to have a flavor that South Campus doesn't have. East Campus will have a flavor that North Campus doesn't have. The West Campus is going to have a flavor that we don't, we don't have because we need different flavors that are going to attract different people. See, I'm old. When Kevin gets up and sings, this is the day, I'm on cloud nine. Right? But these young people that we're reaching at this campus... They're not going to go for this is the day. And I know I'm going way back, Kevin. You didn't do this is the day. But you, you get what I'm saying, right? And so we're going to evolve and grow. So in your ministry, whether you're a department head or, 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 or part of a, de a department, begin to think with your department head how you can do bigger things. Think bigger, dream bigger, and start planning for the growth that's not here now. I love what Eric and Sylvia, when they started young adults, I, th I, I think we had five young adults that I knew of in the church. And they said, well, we're going to need a big room. And I'm thinking, okay. How about this room? No, not big enough. How about this room? No, no that's not going to work. Okay, how about the fellowship hall? We'll take it. Let me tell you, what they're running right now, they don't need a room this big. I mean, it's nice. But you know what? By the end of this year, they're going to need a bigger room because of the vision. That they have. They're training people. Who are you training to take your place? Who are you training to take your place? Pastor David, I encourage you. Get a young man, a young couple, start pouring into them so that in a few years you can sit on the front row and just charge them on to victory. Prayer leaders, are you going out and recruiting or are you just saying, well, nobody wants to pray anymore? I don't believe that. I believe that there's a lot of people that want to pray. They just need to be asked. And if you have a hard time seeing them, Sarah and the seer will see them and she'll work with you to pull them out. And that's what I love about Saren's gift. That's what I love about Pastor Jeff and Saren both. They're just seers. They, they know how to go gold digging. They see the gold in people and they dig it up. And some people go, them? There's been many times I've thought, I think you missed it this time. <laughs> Pastor Jeff, Saren, I think you missed it this time. And I've been wrong every time. Pan for gold. Don't look at where people are. Look at the potential of where they can be. Yeah, they may be living in sin and not married right now. They don't need to be leaders, but that doesn't mean that God's going to get a hold of their life, clean it up, just start speaking into them now. And you know, Eric and Sylvia and I, our generation, man, if you lived together before you were married, and w w us coming up in the church, I mean, you, you just straight to hell, do not pass, go, do not collect $200. And yet we're dealing with that in the church all the time. And we had an incident where some people, they were going to be leaders. And Sylvia called me, Pastor, what do we do? We love them. Tell them that they're welcome here. But if they're going to be in leadership, 
they need to wait to grow a little more because it requires a higher standard. And I was so proud of Sylvia and Pastor, Pastor Sylvia and Eric that, that they took them aside and loved them and, and said that and, and didn't condemn them. And they're still in their ministry, still going, still, still at, not in leadership yet, but we don't throw them away because of what they need to work on now. We keep panning for the gold that's going to be there. We're going to have the transgenders come in. We're going to have homosexuals come in. And what do we do? We got to love them. Not preach against them. I did my first wedding. I did my first wedding that there was not a maid of honor, but a man of honor. Okay? Okay. The old religious me would have went, I'm not going to that wedding. But Jesus said, you know what? You love them. May not be your deal. And it's not the couple's deal. But it's a family member that they love. So you know what? I just focused on Jesus, preached on Jesus, and loved them. Why? Because that's what God wants us to do. Don't confuse loving people with compromise. Okay, don't, don't, don't get them confused. We're not compromising our beliefs. We're just loving people where they are and the changes that need to be done will, the Holy Spirit will bring. I just keep preaching the word. The, Marcus Mitchell's testimony just keeps ringing in my ear. He lived a homosexual life. He was sexually abused by his pastor during church time. You've heard the, you've heard the, the testimony. He went into a homosexual lifestyle. And, and a lady led him to the Lord and never once addressed his sexual preference. Just kept feeding him with the word. Just kept loving him the word. And he said, I got to the point where I learned how Jesus was and I wanted to be like Jesus and Jesus wasn't a homosexual. So I decided I didn't want to be one either. That's his words, not mine. And he said, and people ask me the craziest things. I'm going to go a little deeper here than I would on a Sunday morning. I already have, so I might as well, right? He said, people ask me, well, they would ask me silly questions like, well, are you ever attracted to a man? And he said, as if, as if temptation, once I came to Jesus, would leave. Do you still, and, and you know, his question was, do you still, are you still tempted to lie? And somehow, if he was still attracted to a man, but not acting on it, then he was a, a, a bad person. No. That's something that he gave himself to. That's what he was focused in. And he just, like any other temptation, says no to. Doesn't make him a second-class citizen. Doesn't mean he hasn't truly repented. See, if we're going to reach this generation, we don't compromise the generation, but we love the generation. I know people that are smoking marijuana, Christians in the church that are doing it for medicinal purposes. That's between them and God. No judgment here. I'm not going to do sermons on the, the evils of marijuana smoking. That's up to you and the Holy Spirit. Have some people that love to have a glass of wine with their dinner. I'm not going to condemn that. If that's your deal, that's between you and God. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and maturity and got, get off the clothesline and get into the main line of where God is and God will make, bring the changes that need to be made. Scripture teaches us that when people sin, they know it. You don't have to preach sin to people. I have another friend that lived a gay lifestyle for 30 years. He said, I used to say I was born that way. And I knew in my heart I wasn't, but nobody could argue with that. And he said, I came to Jesus. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't try to change my lifestyle. They just put the word in me and my lifestyle changed. Just like everybody else who comes to Jesus, our lifestyle changes. You still love me? That's how we're going to reach this city. Don't confuse loving people with compromise. We're going to do a summer outreach. The men's ministry is going to do it. Yay, men's ministry. Oh, that's what I like to hear. And I'm going to be getting with them and, and planning that. And um, another thing that I want to talk about real quick before we pray is um, I've got this vision. Pastor Dan Leroy uh, he he uh, did it when he was pastoring, um, what was the name of the church? Anyway, in Rosedale. He, 
connection. Uh, he had a movie screen. He went and he went from park to park and did. And it was a great ministry. Saw lots of people saved. I think he's still doing it. Somebody said great ministry. And I, I, and I want to say his name and what he's doing because I totally support him. And I don't want you to think that I'm trying to or we're going to uh, compete with him. My vision is to get a big movie screen just here on this campus in the summer as an outreach to show Christian movies. And we can also do it as a fundraiser like he does, which is the concession bar. You know, and so if we had a few movie nights this spring and this summer to do that and your ministry wants to get involved in that in doing concessions, man, I'm telling you what, he, he's made thousands of dollars that has really funded what he's doing. And, and I bless Pastor Dan. He's doing a great job and I don't want to compete with him, but I'd like to take the concept and instead of taking it citywide, take it to the North Campus, take it to the South Campus, and use that to reach people. Isn't that a great idea? I wish I would have thought about it, but Pastor Dan thought it first, and God just reminded me. So there's a lot of things that are out there. Are you excited? I said, are you excited? Roy, are you excited? Yes. Woo, that's what I like to hear. Thank you for this time that I have of pouring into your life. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and pour into the people's life that you work at. Yes, Russell. Yeah, that's true. It did. It did. So uh, God is a good God and he loves us all equally. Aren't you glad? I'm so happy for that. So let's stand. Kevin's going to come to the, the, the keyboard. One, one more thing that my wife, she was going to talk about tonight, um, but uh, she wasn't able to make it. And uh, uh, we're going to the doctor in LA tomorrow, which is her appointment. And, and she's going to be better the rest of the month. Amen. But uh, one thing that she w wanted to talk about, and uh, we used to have this policy, and it kind of got out of hand. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. Uh, and don't go, oh, he's talking about me. It, it, we've all been guilty of this. But no more homemade signs around the church. You know, sign up for the barbecue. Uh, you know, we're going to go out and feed the homeless and, you know, the, the, these little things. Uh, th those are great, and I understand why the people that did it did it. But from now on, we're going we're gonna to run those and make them professionally looking through the computer. And if you don't have the means to do that, then call Karen in my office, and she will make that for you. Because we want to do everything in excellence. Excellence isn't perfect. Excellence is just doing the best with what you've got. We redid the floors during the, the Christmas break. They look wonderful. We, we're, we're now, we, we've got people that are going to finish hauling away all the junk where those buildings used to be. Uh, we're painting and we have painted, repainted much of the North Campus. And, and, and we want people, we, looking good isn't our first priority, but it's, a, it's an important priority. And so let's, Let's just make our campuses friendly and clean and inviting. And if you see a light out, you don't have to be anointed by the elders to change a light bulb or to pick up trash or to empty a trash can. Uh, 